should ask Mary. That's kind of why I called this meeting. Who will protect us? Protect our families, our homes, our children. You guys? Ha! Don't make me laugh. Okay, what is up guys? Welcome back to another awesome video. We are now going to go over the first Punic War. We're doing basically a prequel. So yeah, uh, let's get right into it. Please like and subscribe if you're new. Or if you're just watching but you're not subscribed, come on, hit that sub button. You know, I'm pretty excited. I don't know much about the Roman history, so it's interesting to learn new things. I've already seen this video, though, so I will give you that. But maybe I'll discover new things since I haven't seen it in a whole year or something. Oh, Marcellus, you sure have a lot of dignitas. Kiss me. Okay. <laughs> hey, Dad. Hi, son. Just reading the newspaper. What can I do for you? Well, you know how you always say Rome is the greatest civilization in the world? It bloody well is. Well, I was just wondering, what makes us so great? How did we come to be? Wow. My son. Boy, let me take you on a journey. Okay. To this side of the room. Let's go see. <laughs> the story of Rome. Warning. Tales contained within the slideshow presentation may be partially or entirely mythical. Oh, my Begins with these beautiful baby boys oh. going to town on some she-wolf mommy milkers. That's gross. You're gross! Uh, sorry, son. You're not gross. I love you. They're called Romulus and Remus. And Kinda when weird. they grew up in 753 BC, they founded Rome. But there was just one problem. They couldn't agree on which of them should be the king. But they worked it out peacefully, right? <laughs> oh, heavens no. Romulus caved Remus's skull in with a shovel. Here's a picture. Our first king committed fratricide? I know. But look at his face. When's the part where we become the greatest civilization, Dad? Well, you see, at first Rome was full of men. Oh, yeah. I'm talking like a real sausage party. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. So we invited some neighboring cities over for a big feast. And then we literally kidnapped all of their women. Here's a picture. Uh -oh. <laughs> look at that one. She's like... This is messed up. You're messed up. Ugh. Sorry, sorry. I'll be a better father. I promise. So then, finally, after centuries of monarchy, those tyrannical kings started getting a little too big for their britches. So we overthrew the kings and established Rome as a republic. Oh, is that when all the killing stopped? <laughs> Heavens no. That's when the killing surged, baby. We went wild and conquered the Latin League, the Samnites, the Etruscans. Woo! What a rush. Dad, Rome seems pretty barbaric. You're barbaric! Oh, nah. I forgot to tell you about the time a prophet told Saturn his son would one day overthrow him. So, so Saturn literally ate his own son seconds after he was born. I don't want to see a picture. Here's a picture. It's not true, Dad, but it's really look funny. At that. hmm? That's messed up, man. Are we really this uncivilized? Hey, hey! If we were so uncivilized, would we use communal toilets where we all fart and poo together in one big stinky, steamy, dirty I mean, toilet? that was innovative yeah, for the time, Dad, though. Yeah, Dad, we would. Clean your butt with a sponge, Timulus. But all these guys just used it. What's wrong with your... Oh, look at tradesmen given one day to build Rome. Son, bro. I don't want to be Roman. The, this is so the weird. The Times you're New weird. Roman. Uh, sorry, you're not weird. I'm sure you're probably fine. The first Punic War, three minutes right into the video. The Roman Republic, a nation that, since its foundation, had been stabbing necks all the way down the Italian peninsula. Hey, but this is not the famous Roman Empire that ruled the known world. All right. Not yet anyway. This is a relatively juvenile Rome, still just a regional power. In 264 BC, the big daddy of the Western Mediterranean was Carthage. Let's rewind a bit. Carthage was founded in 814 BC when some Phoenicians in Tyre had a mega surplus of goods and decided to export those goods across the Mediterranean. They became the dominant trading power in the region and to support their growing trade network, the Phoenicians established a number of colonies, one of which was Carthage. Therefore, Carthage began its life as a Phoenician trade colony and the Carthaginians were actually Phoenicians. Or, if you're a Latin-speaking Roman, 
they were Punic, hence the name of the video. Oh. Over the centuries, Carthage gradually expanded and became the region's base of power. Music Just like Rome, good. Carthage was a semi-democratic republic with its own senate and judiciary. But there were also some pretty hefty differences between the two. While Rome was big into farming and stabbing people in the neck, the Carthaginians, on the other hand, just like their Phoenician forefathers, had built their power through trade and navigating the waves. They went here and there, selling ivory tusks, gold, and slaves. And as a result, they were rolling in it. Whenever they weren't busy swimming around in their copious hordes of money, in their spare time, they also possibly enjoyed sacrificing their children to Baal, the god of... Let me just check my notes. Ah, yes. Plant fertility. Oh boy, these figs aren't oh, looking great. too hot. Maybe if I throw my son <laughs> I love this moment. The fire, they'll grow. Have you tried watering them, Dad? Hmm. No, we'll try that second. As a result of Bruh. all their trading, Carthage had emerged as one of the Mediterranean's superpowers. But wait, they said. Rome? What the heck is that? Well, I know it's a pretty obscure little country that you've probably never heard of. But this spunky young nation was about to upset the entire region's balance of power. Initially, it's crazy the two how fast enjoyed they grew. relatively friendly relations, and it even signed a couple treaties. But it was a relationship that was practically destined to turn sour. Yep, See, stabbing the neck. Thing where they like to aggressively expand their boundaries, often viewing such expansion as a defensive act. Kind of like when you had to kill your neighbor, because you knew eventually they would have tried to kill you first. Meanwhile, Carthage was extremely protective of its wealthy trade network. So if you put a very strategically important island between them, well, two plus two equals war. Tensions rose, and the two sides began viewing each other with increasing disdain. The hard-working Romans looked across the water at the money-hungry Carthaginians and said, Look at those dishonest crooks. Bet they've never done an honest day's work in their lives. And the Carthaginians looked back and said, Look at those simple-minded brutes. Bet they've never sacrificed a baby in their lives. Yeah! While war between the two superpowers seemed inevitable, the event that finally triggered it was a little unexpected. The whole thing began with a few simple mad lads on a wild night out. These mad lads are called the Mamertines. They were Italian mercenaries employed by the tyrant of Syracuse. Here, but when he died, his successor said, Sorry, fellas, we don't need any big burly men with sharp sticks anymore. You can all go home. Aww. The Mamertines, as it turned out, didn't want to go home. So instead, they went to the nearby town of Messana and said, Hey, man, we are but four little buff boys without a home. May we come in? Aw, poor fellas. Sure thing. Uh -uh. Just so long as you promise not to massacre all of us. <laughs> We promise. The Mamertines then massacred all of them. Well, not all of them, just the men. And they stole their homes and families. Ha! This is my house now. This is my best dad ever mug now. And you guys are my new family. Son? Among us, really? Catch with your old That's a little outdated. You're not my real dad. Ugh. Teenagers. Like Am I right, dear? You're not my real husband. Ugh, I'm so trapped in this marriage. Then get out! No, Masana was now controlled by the Mamertines, and they began raiding up and down the Syracuse coastline. When the new ruler of Syracuse saw this, he wasn't happy. The Syracusans began fighting back, and in response, the Mamertines said, Oh crap, they're fighting back? What do we do? Quick, we'll convince the Carthaginians to come and save us. Oh no! We're in trouble. Oh, no. We need a big, strong empire to come and rub our bellies. Bro. Why are you saying it like that? If I was a big, strong empire, I think I'd like to be seduced. <laughs> See? It's working. The Carthaginians had long been controlling all of Sicily. I like his they jokes, but Syracuse and their Greek influence on the island for really centuries. Good. And now it, it has that like nice. To... It has a nice blend between like, you know, uh, that adult kind of humor. Something kind of reminds me of Animaniacs a bit, and like, you know, you know, being for kids. But to add some context, because I haven't really talked too much, I think like. It's in, in the island there, you can kind of see throughout history, when you have a strategic area, it does out, it does lead to the inevitable, but this whole situation here, it kind of reminds me of, uh, 
kind of like maybe a bit like the colonies. When the empires of Europe were growing, they had to deal with this all the time. Or, you know, like the Cold War. They would have to deal with these little areas that would, you know, pick who they wanted. They wanted to pick, like, these big areas as their friend, as their ally. And that would lead to these big wars going on where these small interest groups would be a part of it. And usually, a lot of these big, you know, problems... It can co it could come back to you know a little bit of a tiny, uh, two tiny small interest areas fighting, right? In the Cold War, you had you know um, with Cuba joining in, uh, getting help from the Soviets. You got uh, North and South Vietnam. You got North and South Korea. Then with the colonial empires, you had a lot of Native American tribes pick who they wanted to decide with, and it kind of is like this, right? Where you have these interest groups that want to pick help from other, you know, groups, and it kind of does lead to a lot of these massive wars. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting to see this, especially from, you know, the BC era. Most of the stuff I know is from, like, AD. Get one over on them. So Carthage promptly answered the Mamertines' cry for help and sent a force to garrison Messana. As it turned out, however, some within the ranks of the Mamertines weren't too happy with the occupying Carthaginians, and they sent out a second cry for help to Rome. When it reached the Roman Senate, they were a little more hesitant. Going to help the Mamertines ran the risk of triggering an all-out war with Carthage, and they had only just finished conquering the Italian peninsula, so they were kind of tired. Plus, the Mamertines were all the way across the water. They had never made a leap like that before. So you Especially had seeing out to avoid any they didn't really have Carthage, much naval technology. The Romans would probably sit this one out, but you would assume wrong. Rome just couldn't resist a good chance for war. Why? Well, there's something you gotta understand about Rome. See, as a republic, they were hellbent on preventing any one man from ever gaining too much power. And so rather than having one leader, Rome had two called consuls who shared power. These consuls could also only serve for one year at a time before new consuls were elected. One year. These measures to limit the powers of the consuls were noble, but had an interesting side effect. The consuls knew they had just one year to try and gain as much glory and prestige as possible, something that was very important in Roman society. And the best way of gaining glory and prestige? Military victory, of course. The Roman political system basically ended up encouraging these consuls to go out and be as aggressive as your Italian grandmother when you don't eat all the spaghetti. And, and this kind of idea, this kind of culture of glory, prestige, it also leads out to the Roman Empire, even though you had a different political system, right? It kind of, it, it created its own culture. It's cre it created its own kind of values and traditions for the nation, which is pretty cool, honestly. So the glory-seeking consuls convinced the people to vote in favor of going to Messana. And in, they went. Upon the arrival of the Romans, the Carthaginians in the city, amongst the confusion, were forced to leave. Now, in contrast to Roman aggression, the Carthaginian military had a slightly different philosophy. All right, kids, listen up. If you want to grow up to be Carthaginian military leaders, there's a few things you have to understand. If you fail to succeed on the battlefield, that's a crucifixion. Showing cowardice, that's a crucifixion. Hello, sir. What, what are you doing here? Aren't you meant to be in Messana? Yeah, but the Romans showed up. So you just left? Sure did. Oh, you better believe that's a crucifixion. Yeah. The Roman consuls were awarded for victory and therefore Probably. tended to be aggressive go-getters. By contrast, the Carthaginian generals were brutally punished for failure, and so they tended to be more cautious and restrained. This dynamic is helpful for understanding some of the crazy things that happened during the Punic Wars. So, the Romans... The Romans kind of remind me of Don Doyle for some reason. I don't know, that, that's the kind of vibe I get. Have crossed over to you don't know who John Doyle is, I recommend you watch him. Hit that panic button. This turn of events was unacceptable to both Carthage and Syracuse, so the traditional enemies teamed up to kick the Romans off their island. They surrounded the city and said, Hey, you jerks, this isn't your island. Come out of there at once. Okay, we're coming. See, Phil, you just got to speak with authority. That's what being an alpha male's all about. Hey, man. Uh, oh, you, you 
think that they were the red pillars. No, I, I didn't mean... Oh, crap. Out the Roman legions came to engage the Carthaginians in battle, and they sent them packing. With the Battle of Messana, whether intended or not, by going to help the Mamertines, the two sides had just slipped into an all-out war. This happened so many times in With history. The initial Roman it's victory, not even funny. Towns across Sicily, including Syracuse, began switching allegiance because being a winner is yep. more fun. But the Carthaginians weren't about to just give up that easily. In 262 BC, they began building up their forces at Agrigentum. So the Romans, being aggressive go-getters, aggressively go got them. The Romans immediately laid siege, hoping to starve out the Carthaginian garrison. However, because this was the first time Rome had been fighting outside the Italian peninsula, across the water, they struggled to supply their forces, and before yeah, long, it's the Romans were as starving as the Carthaginians they were besieging. They had to forage for food, leaving them open to ambush. And when Carthaginian reinforcements arrived, creating a double siege, things got really bad. Everybody starved each other for months until nobody could take it anymore, and they all finally came out for battle, which Rome won. Here's the report from the recent siege at Agrigentum, sir. We killed 30,000 while only suffering 7,000 losses? That's amazing! Nope. We're the best! <laughs> yes, sir. Whoops, those are the wrong yeah. way around. What? We lost yeah. 30,000? That's crazy. We're the worst! But we won, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. But we also got our asses kicked. Yes, sir. So are we the best or the worst? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, my honest opinion, how I see it. Yeah, they might have won, but if you keep on draining yourself so much, even if you win, did you really win? Think of like, you know, Napoleon, which I always use Napoleon as an example because he did everything. Napoleon, yeah, he like barely lost any troops when he was taking out the Russians. He succeeded so well, but the environment took him out and he kind of suicided himself. So you don't, you know, even if you do win, you got to be careful about how much you have in resources. You don't have an infinite amount. Even the greatest of leaders, if they have nothing, well, they lose. The Romans won at Agrigentum because they were aggressive go-getters, and they now began eyeing up the possibility of conquering the entire island. But they also suffered very heavy losses, and it was clear they couldn't sustain a campaign if they couldn't supply their troops. Here's the issue. Sicily was an island. Islands are surrounded by water. A strong navy would be vital for supplying troops and winning the war. Here was Carthage's navy, and here was Rome's. I think you can see the problem. Historians debate just how much naval experience Rome had at this point. Presumably, they must have had something to defend their shoreline. But whatever it was, it would have paled in comparison to the Carthaginian juggernaut. And so Rome had to figure out exactly what to do about all this water. Come on, men. We're not going to let some pansy candy-ass water get in the way of our glorious victory against Carthage. Charge! Oh. Oh, my kids. I love them. We're going to need a bigger boat. What's a boat? I don't know. If the Romans wanted to win this war and obtain Sicily, technology only war. I like the Cold War. Do. I guess we're just gonna have to go ahead and build ourselves a war fleet, aren't we? From scratch? From scratch. Well, we don't even know how. Never mind how to fight with one. Don't worry, Hank. We're up to the challenge. Come on, guys. We're Romans, and Romans aren't afraid of anything. <laughs> And so, the Romans worked long and hard trying to figure out how on earth you actually build the latest style of warship. In the end, they had a bit of luck on their side. A Carthaginian Quinquirin ended up accidentally grounding on Italian soil. The Romans oh. found it and copied that the That guy design. crashed it. What an idiot. was being built, the Romans trained rowers on land. And would you believe it? The Romans put together a full fighting Geniuses, fleet of bro. 120 warships in just two months. A staggering feat. Now, I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified. If the Romans can build a war fleet from scratch in two months, then why does it take you half a year to make a video? No, now a year to make a video. Subscriber, I think you should shut up. What the heck? How on earth did the Romans learn how to build a war fleet? 
This shouldn't be happening. From what I hear, they copied the design from us, sir. Well, how on earth did they get the blueprint, Carl? I, I don't know, sir. And building a war fleet. So now the Romans have a navy, and it's time to put it to the test. But how does one wage ancient naval warfare? Easy. All of the ships had giant bronze rams on the front, so all you had to do was outmaneuver the enemy and give him the jimmies. Easy as pie. And so the aggressive Romans set out for some good old-fashioned jimmy giving. The consul, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, set out for the uh, town. Oh, uh, no, Tyre, they... Believing the garrison there wanted to join the Romans. As he entered the harbor, however, he found himself trapped by a Carthaginian fleet. And in the following skirmish, he was completely outmatched. The Romans may have had a brand new fleet, but when it came to engaging in actual combat, their inexperience showed. There was just something better about the Carthaginian ships. The Carthaginian rowers had nicer abs. The entire Carthaginian empire had been built on expert seamanship. So when it came to water, the Carthaginians were better and the Romans were wetter. In their initial skirmish, the Romans were beaten so badly that the consul, Scipio, was given a nickname, Asina. And if you're wondering what that means, just drop the Ina. So what were the Romans to do? How could they possibly stand up to this Carthaginian superpower? Well, there's something you gotta understand about the Romans. Back when they found that Carthaginian ship and copied its design, that wasn't a one-off thing. Copying their enemies was as Roman as punishing murderers by sewing them into a leather pouch with a monkey, snake, and rooster, and then throwing them into a river, which is a thing they did. Wait, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, copying their enemies. Many of the most famous Roman inventions were actually borrowed. Aqueducts, chariot racing, their gods. Even in warfare, the Romans would get pierced by a Sabine javelin, and they'd be like, wow. They'd get hacked to bits by an Iberian sword, and they'd be like, Wow! And they'd copy the designs for themselves. However, they wouldn't just copy it. They would advance it, finding ways to adapt it as perfectly as possible. And in the case of naval warfare, the Romans realized if they wanted to beat the Carthaginians at their own game, they would have to adapt. The Romans excelled at combat on land, not on water. But what if, they said, we could somehow turn a sea battle into a land battle? sounds crazy genius right well they made a couple of tweaks to their warship and look, oh, here they come one of the most genius they things they did their asses kicked up, probably sir. the best thing they could have done ever in this war their ships. the best idea ever in at this time like during the war idiots. look at that thing that'll make them blow over i mean look at <laughs> look at that they're just getting ready to kill <laughs> Uh oh. I mean, how stupid can you be? Let's just add a big wooden tower to our ship that'll weigh us down and blow us over in the wind. <laughs> I mean, what does that thing even do? Oh. Yep. The had built a big swinging spiked gangway called the Corvus. So when the Carthaginian ships approached to ram them, the Romans would just slam them. The Carthaginians tried going around. No problem. The Corvus could swivel. Try going behind. The Romans would huddle to the coastline. It was foolproof. Those big, Geniuses. sexy Carthaginian rowing muscles could flex all they want, but they were no match for the Roman mind. So, ladies, you see, what really matters is what's on the inside. <laughs> no. Please go out with me. And with that, the Romans, who had only just recently began dabbling in the art of naval combat, thanks to their ingenious Corvus, had just managed to outclass the Mediterranean seafaring superpower. The Carthaginians were stunned, and the general in charge of the defeated Carthaginian fleet? Well, you better believe that's a crucifixion. With their newfound control of the seas, the Romans could now more easily blockade coastal cities and supply their legions on land. Surely, the Romans were now free to unleash their aggression all over the island. Ha ha! Hey, Carthaginians, what are you gonna do now that we're free to rampage across the island? We're gonna go inside these walls and close this gate. 
Oh, come on, guys. Stop messing around. Come out so we can kill you. No. Oh, come on. No. No. Ow, no. To counter the new no. Roman supremacy, the Carthaginians decided to engage in a defensive war of attrition, forcing the Romans to engage in siege after lengthy siege. The war in Sicily became a long, hard, back and forth slug. One by one, cities slowly fell as the Romans gained ground. Occasionally, the Carthaginians countered and even pushed them back, only for the Romans to rebound again. And whenever a city did finally fall, the Romans could delight in slaughtering the entire population and selling any survivors into slavery, which was pretty standard procedure at the time. In general, the campaign on land was progressing much slower than the Romans had hoped, and quite frankly, they were getting sick of it. So in 256 BC, they decided that something had to change. Hey everyone, my name's Marcus Attilius Regulus, and I'll be one of your consuls for this year. Look, as I'm sure you all know, Sicily's being a bit of a drag. Sure, I could go and spend my entire year as consul besieging one single city, but they'll never make a naked statue of me for that. So here's the new plan. I'm gonna skip Sicily entirely, take my army, and go right for the heart of Carthage itself. I'll slaughter the men, enslave all the women and children, and when I return, you'll all build a thousand naked statues of me. Uh, Marcus, that women and children stuff, that seems pretty evil and barbaric. No, Jim, it's perfectly normal in the ancient world. Sometimes we even chop their pets in half. Okay, guys, looks like the Romans are coming straight for us this time. And what will they do when they get here? They'll kill us all. What? They'll massacre each and every last one of us. They may even chop our pets in half. That's barbaric. No, Rob, it's actually pretty normal for the time. We'd do the same to them. Who will protect us? Funny you should ask, Mary. That's kind of why I called this meeting. Who will protect us? Protect our families, our homes, our children. You guys, ha, don't make me laugh. Why, you're just a bunch of stupid and weak farmers. Simple-minded buffoons. Cowards. Fools. Rob here thinks enslaving women and children is barbaric. You're a snowflake, Rob. Yes, you are. The fact is, yes, you if are. the Romans manage to land on African soil, we're all gonna die. A terrifying. Hideous, I love this speech. Painful I love this speech. Is that the end of that speech? Yes. Oh. The Carthaginians had to stop the Romans from ever landing in Africa because they believed that would be the end. So as the Romans were building an invasion fleet, the size of which the world had never seen before, the Carthaginians yeah, crazy, were preparing man. an even... It's all about that ambition and energy. You need to be able to wield it the best you can ever. It, it really goes to show. Bigger one, to stop them. And in it's really inspiring to see how the Romans BC, were able to do this Roman all. invasion fleet made its way south, just once. the stage was set for a humongous battle that saw 680 warships, around 300,000 men, fighting to decide the course of the war. To this day, the Battle of Cape Egnomus remains possibly the largest naval battle in human history. Like, look at that. That's a, that's a great thumbnail. History, all the way back Potential. in ancient times. So the next time your granddad tells you about the time he sank a Japanese aircraft carrier, kick him in the nuts. The Romans uh -oh. had a lot riding on this battle. They weren't just sending their warships, but transports as well, full of supplies and horses for their invasion of Africa. They therefore formed a protective wedge-like formation to punch through the long, thin Carthaginian line. The Carthaginian generals, however, desperate to prevent the Romans from reaching Africa, had a plan of their own. As the Roman fleet approached, the Carthaginian center feigned a retreat, luring the Romans in so their outstretched flanks could envelop them and get around the Roman Corvus. A clever plan. But with such a huge battle and so many ships crowded together, the Carthaginians struggled to maneuver as hoped. And in the chaos, three separate battles emerged across the huge battle space. With the number of ships limiting their ability to maneuver, the Carthaginians became sitting ducks, and all the Romans had to do 
was start swinging. The Roman center came out on top and were then able to turn around and rescue their pinned down flanks. The battle of Cape Egnomus was a Roman victory. Let's see. 30 to 40,000 kills. Meanwhile, the Romans only lost 10,000. 94 ships lost. 30 sunk. 64 captured. 24 ships lost. All sunk. Result, a massive Roman victory. That's massive, man. They killed four times the amount. And, uh, yeah. We'll get to part two soon. Thank you so much for watching. This is, um, really cool. It really does go to show the powered ability of the Romans. Yeah, and, uh, Bennett out.